All right, so in this section, we're going to talk about labeled namespaces. Um, that sounds a little bit uh, grandiose as a title, uh, but what you're going to see really quickly is that you already know this concept. You've seen it in uh, C++ or Java or other languages that you've used, um, but this is the concept. So uh, the kind of the definition, a labeled namespace, this is our official definition, okay? Any language construct. Um, irrespective of the language, it's going to be called different things, that contains definitions, which again, you get that idea, and a region of the program where those definitions apply. In other words, there's, it's kind of like a scope thing, like we've talked about, again, relative to scoping, but in particular, this is a situation in which there's a name that we can use to access those definitions outside the construct. So when we talked about, about uh, scoping before, for example, we talked about blocks, you know, there's a certain definition, um, like the let structure in ML or, or you know, local variables in, uh, in just languages that have, you know, local variables within functions. And um, what we're talking about here is a situation like we might tend to see in object-oriented programming where you've got an object and there's a certain method and the method has some public um, access and you can see it and you can call it by that name, right? In ML, we have this idea of a structure. So here's an example <clears throat> of, of the structure uh, construct in ML, okay? Uh, we see in this case, we've got structure Fred and, um, and he's a struct. And then we've got a value A, and we've got some function, etc. And, you know, these guys, you know, so A's inside that context. But by naming this thing Fred, later on we can use Fred.A and Fred.F. So that's an example um, of a situation where we, once having named it, we can access it externally, okay? Well, I mean, that's the basic idea. So in, in other languages, specifically in C++, we have a thing called a namespace. In Java, you may have been exposed to packages, Ada had packages, uh, Modula 3 had modules, and you kind of get the idea. Um, any, any class definition, as I mentioned, really kind of fits the, uh, the same sort of definition of a namespace, okay, as a, the, the concept that I can... Um, you know, get to things inside the class. So here's an, an example of that, um, where I've got a, a class called month, it's public. I've got um, a couple of uh, variables, interior, internal, min and max. Um, they're also public, they're static ints. And, um, and then I could, uh, you know, see min and max visible within the rest of the class, but then also from outside, but I then have to say, month.min, month.max, right? And so, I mean, again, that's just to reiterate this idea that you've seen this before in the context of object-oriented programming. So, okay, one of, the, um, one of the big advantages, right, is that we have this sort of inherent conflict, which is we want to use simple names like Max, memorable simple names like Max. Um, but if I want to try to access things globally, I've got to have, you know, like this example, Max supplier bid, instead of just within the context of the supplier bid having this idea of a Max, right? Um, and the problem is it's really back to the same thing we started off with at the beginning of this whole chapter, which is if I've got a bunch of uh, Bobs in my life, uh, I need to be able to separate them. And if there's a max that's associated with supplier bid, then uh, wouldn't it be nice if I could just, you know, disambiguate that and kind of provide the context. So with namespaces, I can kind of do both. Inside the namespace, it's just max. And I have the context. Outside, I'm differentiating it because it's part of supplier bid. So supplier bid dot max um, is actually, you know, kind of nice and, and self-explanatory. Um, from a programming perspective and, and a lot cleaner than trying to have max supplier bid as a global thing and try to manage all of that, um, you know, differentiated variable names. Um, so it, it creates kind of a nice style that, that in many respects becomes not only simpler when I'm inside the supplier bid 
uh, namespace in whatever form that takes, but also then exterior. So here we're talking about, under namespace refinement, what we're talking about is ways of further refining the concept of a namespace, right? Um, uh, for example, uh, I'd like some aspects of my namespace to be public. I'd like some aspects to be private, right? And, um, and that's really kind of the, the basic idea, and we'll kind of get into that for a second. I want to talk for a second about uh, information hiding and abstract data types, okay, for just a second. Information hiding is a concept that goes way back to Dave Parnas. Um, just this whole notion that I shouldn't have to expose everything to everybody at all times. I need to keep things within their context unless I really have to expose it externally, okay? And then I keep the, the scopes kind of small so I can maintain more readily. I'm maintaining within an object. It kind of really was a precursor to the concept of objects in object-oriented programming. And then it led to this concept of abstract data types, okay? Which again was the notion of, uh, it really again, almost a precursor to object-oriented ideas and objects where I've got this strict interface, I hide the details. And these are two related ideas. So here's an example and this is not in a language, okay? This is a, an idealized language. This isn't a real thing. But it does kind of give you the idea. So here in this example, I, I take a namespace. Um, I call it dictionary, and I say it has these things, right? Well, it turns out that some of these are like initial size hash table. These are implementation things, and people outside shouldn't be able to see that. Other things like create, insert, search, delete, these are clearly interface definitions that you want to have visible. And you need to have the ability to keep some of them private and expose some of them. And in different languages, as we'll kind of see here, in different languages, you see it dealt with differently, right? In C++, um, the namespace actually specifies the visibility. And, and we'll give you an example of that, okay? Um, in other languages like ML, um, you know, you've got this separate construct that defines the interface um, to a namespace. And we call that a signature, which we'll get to. And then uh, some languages combine them. And here's an example. Again, we're still kind of in an idealized idea, but one approach is to actually, um, within the same namespace, you delineate the private and the public, right? So here would be private space, and then you've got those things, then the public, and then you've got those things, okay, and that's very C++-ish. Um, then you've also got another angle, another approach, which is you would actually separate the concepts. So I might say that there's an interface and say that it contains these things, and then I've got a namespace, you know, that contains these things, and, you know, give them sort of different names, um, you know, and you kind of have to decide which one you like better. Again, different languages are going to take uh, different approaches to this. And that's it for the scoping with labeled, uh, labeled namespaces. And the next podcast, we're going to talk about primitive namespaces.